You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we give credit where credit's due in Fab Facts. A friendly enemy is helping us find our way home in the randomizer. And we have Richard III. At Richard Taylor's interview part three, that is. Ah, that's all coming up in pod 163. Of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. With it. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Now what? is the uh, podcast of our discontent <laughs> made glorious summer by this son of Anderson. No, doesn't quite work, does it? Are you done? Yeah, I think I'm done, yeah. Uh, you obviously needed to get that out. It was sort of well, festering, yeah. was it? I went to see a bit of, you know, a bit of Shakespeare this week, so I'm, I'm in the mood for it. I see. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it hasn't quite got me in the mood yet, but I'm sure oh, it will by the end of this time. podcast. Yeah. Uh, who are you? Oh, well, I'm Richard James. Who are you? Uh, I'm Jamie Anderson. And who oh. is that over there darning who socks? Yeah, again. Has he been darning socks before? I'm sure he's been doing something to his socks before. Oh, I thought he was looking... He was, no, he was looking at badges the other week. Anyway, I think they're my <laughs> socks he's darning this time. Ah, so, fine, um, fine. Thank you very much, Chris Dale over there. Yes, Who's yes, repairing all of my holy socks, which, I, you know, you didn't need to do that, Chris, but I suppose you're just killing no. time until the randomizer, which you'll be along with later on, where he watches a random Jerry Anderson episode and comments he upon does. it. He um, does. But what else can people expect from this podcast, Richard? What? From the Jerry Anderson podcast, you mean? The Jerry Anderson podcast. What sort of things yeah. do you think? Is there a what, theme? What the... The, pod, the podcast dedicated to the works, legacy, and future productions based on properties and ideas from the producer, Jerry Anderson, you mean? Yeah, I've got no, no idea what might be ahead, really. No. So can you well, elucidate? I'll give you, to give you some sort of yeah rough idea, uh, we've got Fab Facts in just a moment. Uh, some people's favourite part of the podcast. Yes. Whereby Jamie will flick through a book of Fab Facts and pick a Fab Fact that's particularly fab. I'm just tell us getting it, it now. I'm just warming up oh, my great. freaking thumb. <gasps> How exciting. Has it got cold, then? <laughs> yes, it has. Yeah. Now the weather's cooled should, down. Well, you should keep it somewhere warm, shouldn't you? Uh, a little later on, we've got part three of Jamie's interview with uh, Robert Taylor. Richard Taylor. <laughs> Stop calling him Robert. That's Sir Richard Taylor to you. Yes, that's right. From uh, Weta, of course. Yes. And uh, we've got uh, some news, 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 news from the Jerry Anderson universe. I'm sorry, I'm a bit high. I've been away. I'm not actually high, high. What I mean is I'm high on doing the podcast. So I've been away for a week. You're high on life. And it, and it all feels very new and fresh again, having come back to do the podcast. Good, I'm glad Quite to nice. hear it. Good for you. It. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what have I missed out? Our lovely podstrons, of course, have been emailing us in at podcast.jerryanderson.co.uk. They've been posting on our Facebook group and uh, also tweeting us, Richard N. James. I'm Jamie Anderson. Chris Dalek, uh, and I'll be reading out some tweets and Facebook posts a little later on. And I think that's probably about it for now. Good. That's plenty. Yeah. I mean, you know, mm. we haven't got all day. Really... Yeah, true. <laughs> and well, I mean, I our have, but... uh, <laughs> so, dear Podstron, yeah. how about a fab mm. fact? Because that's what I'm about to bring to you now in a section called Fab Facts. Genius. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. So, it's Fab Facts. As Richard may have already yeah. explained, I've got a book of Fab Facts. I'm going to flick through it. Richard will shout fad, Fab, not Fad, mm. Fab, no. at a random no. point. Otherwise, it would be called Fad Facts. Um, yeah, which isn't a bad idea. No. Okay, well, f- we'll keep it Fab Facts for now, but maybe Fad Facts right. next week. Anyway, when he shouts Fab, I will stop flicking and we'll read out a Fab Fact from that page. Richard James, mm. are you mm. primed and ready? Primed and ready. Great. Then here we go. Fab! I see. What? What have I done? Well, weirdly, actually, there's a picture of you <laughs> on ah, one of the hello. pages here. Oh, but it's great. nothing to do with you. Oh. Podcast listeners with long memories may recall a fab fact from, well, a couple of years ago. Right. Regarding the departure from Captain Scarlet due to other commitments of voice artists Paul Maxwell and Charles Tingwell after, after episode 12, Shadow of Fear. Right, right. 
Today's Fab Fact is going to explore several similar oddities around the voice cast of the original Captain Scarlet. For instance, mm. the fact that it wasn't until the following episode in production, The Heart of New York, that regular Scarlet guest voice artist Gary Files, David Healy and Martin King even received a credit for their work on the show, despite the fact mm. that they'd all been providing voices for about 10 episodes by that point. All right. The reason for that seems to have been that, in theory, it was easier to create create one master list of all the voice artists on the credits for every episode and then just keep using that over and over again rather than creating different lists for every single individual episode Hmm, um that being an era in which creating captions was very expensive compared Hmm. to today when you can just you know type it in again that's right obviously for a a show like fireball xl5 with only four uh voice actors for the whole cast and the whole series that kind of made sense. But for a show with at least 16 regular cast members like Captain Scarlet, that was never going to work. Right. However, they tried it anyway. But because of various actors coming and going, the voice artist's credit list was incomplete from episode to, uh, episode two onwards. For instance, you can hear actor Neil McCallum's voice in Winged Assassin and Big Ben Strikes Again, uncredited. And from around episodes four, five and six in production, order, you start to hear the likes of Healy, Files and King providing voices also uncredited Ah. so when the voice cast list on the end credits was finally updated for the heart of new york it now included healy files and king but not mccallum who possibly wasn't expected to return but interestingly retained the now departed maxwell and tingwell maybe they hope they might come back or maybe they uh, that was used to cover up their performances in clip shows possibly Mm. Uh, it also included another name who must have turned up at the voice studio on that precise day when the cast list caption was being revised that (laughs) name was Lian Xing Yang who who provided the voice of Harmony Angel in place of Harmony's regular voice artist Liz Morgan in the episode The Launching now since Liz hadn't left the show we're not certain why Lian Xing was hired to play Harmony obviously hiring a Chinese actor to voice a character who is either Chinese or Japanese, depending on Harmony's backstory, wherever you read it, um, is absolutely the right thing to do. But then, for whatever reason, Lian Xin never returned to the series after that, so Harmony, who was already a pretty minor character on TV anyway, never spoke again. (laughs) Right. Wow. And... Since the credits voice list, uh, voice cast list was never updated again after that, the likes of Neil McCallum, who returned for two more episodes near the end of the show, and Shane Rimmer, never received any on-screen credit for their voice work on Captain Scarlet. However, that one perfectly scheduled performance as Harmony got Lian Xin Yang's name into the credits for for 20 episodes, despite the fact that she only did one. (laughs) Yeah, I like it. Cool. Good, lucky her. That's not fair, is it? It really isn't fair. I have two thoughts about that particular fab fact Jamie. do you firstly well when they were making these shows i don't think it really mattered like it would do now do you think you know i don't think people took that much notice of the credits like we do now i mean we really get our knickers in a twist about credits now don't we we worry about them being shrunk down when we're watching things and we worry about them being missed off entirely when we're watching various platforms yep. you know, at the end of shows and so on but i don't i don't think they really bothered that much then i don't think I think it was literally understood that, oh, we didn't have time. We'll just, you know, uh, we'll go with last week's. It's fine. Mm. And also, these things were only, as we often say, meant to be watched the once, weren't they? Well, exactly. Not poured over again. No, Uh, they certainly weren't expecting us to pour over it, uh, you know, 55 years later. Yeah. But secondly, it must make an absolute nightmare for those, you know, TV historians and archivists who like to keep imdb updated with you know credits for every episode of every tv show ever very difficult to research i would think exactly oh, who yeah. was doing which voice and when oh extremely if tricky. they're not credited yeah extremely tricky yeah yes. and i suppose for these artists they were just popping in for the day you know yeah. doing an hour or two's work and then yeah. disappearing yeah. they weren't they didn't know that it was going to be big and they didn't know it would carry no. on then no uh, it, was, it was probably a now. thing that they never thought they'd hear from ever again exactly and if you ask yeah. most of them probably uh, you know about those those episodes or those stories they wouldn't remember them really it's just a no, of course tiny wouldn't. tiny yeah. piece of a, a much bigger career so yeah yeah there you go mm. oh well they're getting credited now on uh, yeah. uh, in the medium of audio so there we go that's nice yeah, yeah good. any further thoughts before we wrap this one up no further thoughts let's wrap it up good then we're wrapping up this week's voice credit fact credit <laughs> fact yeah Credit, voice, voice credits okay. voice yeah. credits yeah all right yeah yeah, yeah. Fair enough. credit where it's due i suppose all right over anyway, to you. uh now 
Just a quick word before we move on. Please do subscribe to us if you're listening now, which I assume you are, on whichever platform you're listening to us on. And leave us a nice review and a rating because that really does help our standings in the algorithms and so on. And it might just mean that other people get to see the podcast and they might have a listen. And you can also help that by just copying the link and posting it in all your social media sites. You know, every week when a new episode comes out, pop it on your Facebook, pop it on your Twitter feed, and uh, other people will uh, maybe get to like us too. Yes. Uh, Now, we have had a fair few emails, uh, so I'm going to dive straight in with this from Chris Yost, uh, who emailed to say, and you'll like this, Jamie, ahoy hoy. Ahoy hoy? You like that, don't you? That's how uh, you used to answer the phone, wasn't it? That's right. Uh, yeah. He says, the wife and I were re-re-watching Only Fools and Horses and the season or series five episode, The Frog's Legacy, in which Dell learns that he has an inheritance of stolen gold bullion if he can find where a friend of his mother's, nicknamed Freddy the Frog, has hidden it. In the market, he's talking to Trigger and Boise, and he asks, did either of you ever hear of Freddy the Frog? After thinking for a moment, Trigger replies, "Uh, no, no, not Freddy the Frog, but I do remember Torchy the Battery Boy. (laughs) Through the laughter, you can't hear Boise, who replies with something along the lines of, I'm surprised you don't remember Twizzle. Anyway, keep Amazing. on keeping on. That's from Chris Yost. Oh, I didn't know that one. I've, I've spot, seen quite a Chris. few were. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, Stuart got in touch to say, Howdy, Richard and Jamie. As Howdy. ever, excellent work on the podcast. My go-to listen on a Monday morning following the dreariness of the news. Uh, on the audiobooks, yes, lots of them coming out now, Stuart. Mm. He says, Would there be a possibility of offering these as USB sticks as I no longer own a CD player? The USB would wonderfully work wonderfully in the van as I gallivant around the country for work. Warm regards, Stuart. Oh, it's a nice idea. USB stick, yeah. Maybe. I've not heard of... mm, Really? Would such a thing be possible, do you think? Yeah, I don't see why not. I think um, No Such Thing as a Fish did a, a USB audio cassette as in it was in the shape right. of an audio cassette but it was a USB uh-huh. drive with the first 100 episodes of their podcast on I oh, think okay. so it's definitely yeah. doable alright uh, one for the file then uh, Paul Hyde said uh, hello hope everybody's well I have an idea is there any chance that a belt could be made to go with uh, cosplay t-shirts off Space 1999 so that the lucky podders can then put their comlock and stun gun on it would make a great sense and complete the cosplay hope you can help and that's from Paul Hyde no punctuation there at all thanks Paul anyway uh, so a belt would be good wouldn't it well we've had a few uh, queries about belts and trousers and various things yeah no plans immediately yeah. Um, we're going to work on security and operations. Okay. Uh, I nice. think it's operations, the red one, first. Um, but we may mm. extend it out because the, the fabric is dyed yeah. specifically for this, this use. So right. um, it's something that we could match up. So maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Probably. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Scott By says, uh, Hello, Jamie and Richard. I've now finally managed to listen and catch up with all 161 episodes of the podcast. Cool. He says that's approximately seven months of three to four episodes per day on average. (laughs) That's quite something, Um, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. I have a question for you both, he says, regarding UFO. What would happen to Straker's wife if she discovered the Shadow Organisation? Would she be able to join the organisation, just like what happened to Paul Foster? Would she have her mind erased? Or would she meet an untimely end? Hmm. I suspect she'd be disappeared. Crikey, that's harsh, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, Yeah, it's a bit like our listeners. (laughs) <laughs> what disappearing <laughs> yeah. yeah no I don't, I don't know um it's um it's an interesting question if you've got an yes. idea of what you think would happen to mary straker um yeah. then do email us podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk with your plans to silence her and prevent <laughs> her from spilling the beans about shadow <laughs> i mean it would make it for a very interesting episode wouldn't it yeah it would have been fun if they'd explored that a bit yes he says uh oh no this is john honeyball now we're talking about the um, Thunderbirds uh, stage show that was on Fab Facts a couple of weeks ago. The original Thunderbirds the stage puppet show. The one, yes. That's right. Uh, John Honeyball says, I saw the show in Chelmsford in 1975. I would have been about 10 or 11. My mum took me probably as a birthday treat, and I think it was at the big theatre in the centre of town. The only thing I could remember was how disappointed I was with it. It was just very weak and small scale. But then he says, hope that helps. <laughs> John Honeyball. That's a shame, isn't it? Yeah. The people's memories of it are so... Uh, yeah. 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 But there we are. Uh, I've got a long one here from Simon Morris. Should I oh, take a deep breath? 
Yeah, go for mm. it. Big deep breath. Right. Yeah. Hi, he says. I listened to the fab facts on married couples in the Andiverse. Very interesting. And spotted a couple of couples from Space 1999 with the husband and wife writing team of Pip and Jane Baker. I suppose best known for their work on Doctor Who, having penned the 1999 episode A Matter of Balance. And I suppose it's nominal, really. But there was also the post-Space 1999 marriage of Sarah Douglas and Richard Le Parmentier, who appeared in different Space 1999 episodes and who both went on to appear in Superman 2, of course. According to IMDb, they were married between 1981 and 1984. Going back a little further in andathology or UFOology. Andathology is a great term. I like that. Is it? (laughs) Uh, The actress singer Aisha, who featured in that earlier show, didn't marry anyone from that or indeed any other Anderson series, but had a notable puppeteering connection anyway. And outside her pop music show Liftoff with owl puppet Ollie Beak and dog puppet Fred Barker, having been once married to Christopher Bruff, son of Peter Bruff of Archie Andrews fame. If tricky crossovers are your thing, says Simon, one of ventriloquist dummy Archie Andrews comic co-stars on the radio was Stanley Unwin. I could waffle for a long time about connections here, there and everywhere or marrying up random facts of that sort that link back to Anderson shows. Marriages of convenience, you might say. Anyway, hope all's well and in the best tradition of all Anderson series, onwards and upwards for all of us. Take care, Simon Morris. Cheers, Simon. Yeah, that's nice, isn't it? Just a couple more. Caleb Ricardo, which is a name I wish I'd thought of myself. Mm. Um, Hi, he says, I don't know if you know this fab fact, but in Thunderbirds Argo, the movie, the town it crashes into is made of Lego. I thought you might find it interesting. I didn't know that. I'm sure I've heard it. Yeah. When did did Lego start? When did Lego kind of take hold in the UK? Right. I don't know. 60s, perhaps? Yeah, I guess so. I'm just wondering how much of a new new material it would have been or a new yeah. uh, a new option well yeah yeah and finally hi jamie richard and chris i've been enjoying your podcasts and this is from mark lawson especially the fab facts which is a bit like behind the scenes special features on a dvd uh, and i also enjoy the newsy news items too uh, it's great to be able to catch up on all the latest goings on with the jerry anderson universe it's my brother dave's birthday today so please give him a shout out birthday greeting if you can fab greetings to you all mark and kaz lawson well, there you go. Happy well, birthday to Dave. Happy birthday to Dave for a few days ago, because yeah. we don't put record on the day of yeah. release. Well, uh, that's right. Yeah. Then we'd have to be up but, at four o'clock in the morning to do that, wouldn't well, we? We would. We would, yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We do often get the odd uh, sort of birthday request, but as you say, just difficult to do because we record ahead of time and so yeah. on, but that seemed pretty pretty current. Uh, so there we are. Do get your comments and reviews and perhaps even birthday requests in for next time by sending them into podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Please do. We look forward to hearing from you in due course. Yeah. Richard James, would you like some news, especially because some of it concerns you? Oh, well, in that case, bring it on. It's the Jerry Anderson News. Featuring me. It's the Jerry Anderson News News News. In that, oh. Going. Really? You can still say it. I didn't say it as news, well as news, you did. News. Yeah. Oh. No. Can I spot now? Go on. D- now. Right. News, yeah, news, news, news. Uh, yeah. oh, oh, just anyway, get on with the news. It's the Jerry Anderson News, 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 yes. News. And oh. let's start with something Richard James related, because that'll make him oh. very happy indeed. And that is... Yeah, go on, then. Five Star Five. The <gasps> audio book, the uh, audio drama novel book thing. Yes. Um, is available now at bigfinish.com yes the digital version the cd and book versions will follow in the next couple of weeks exciting sounds lovely sounds pretty marvelous yeah. to me some beautiful work by benji clifford on the sound design music it's five star five <laughs> it's five star five yeah that's the that's the that's the music <laughs> <laughs> but that that came from me and Benji talking about oh you know how Derek Wadsworth um, did uh, you know like the day after tomorrow, which was yeah. the same had the day <laughs> after tomorrow. That's right. Mm-mm. Yes, you've got to be able to sing the title along with the theme tune. It was a very seventies thing to do, and even Joe yes. Ninety for Barry Gray. So um, yeah, yeah. so that's where Benji based it from. He's done a fantastic job. It's a great yeah. a great piece with Robbie Stevens intense reading of the book yes um, and, a, and a host of characters too. Uh, yeah well many many characters so there you go dad's answer to star wars finally brought to life by a very talented bunch of people and written by richard james hey, uh, hey of course he's one of those talented <laughs> people uh speaking of talented people 
Mm-hmm. Our friend, well, I don't know. Fr- oh. <laughs> friend of the show, Lee Sullivan. Oh, yes. You know him. Do you remember way back in uh, April and for Jerry Anderson Day, we showcased a couple of Lee's lovely bits of art, the yeah, goodies and baddies lineups? Yep. Well, they're finally out and available at the Jerry Anderson store. Strictly ah. limited to 250 of each, hand numbered and signed by the artist, that's Lee Sullivan. Um, the framed yes. editions are available to order right now. They are in stock and shipping. So just go onto the store and search Lee Sullivan or search goodies or search baddies. Mm-hmm. And it's a lineup of 10 of each of the, uh, the best known Jerry Anderson goodies and baddies. And they are lovely. They beautifully Good. presented, gorgeous things. Yeah. Um, if you are still waiting for your Thunderbirds Terror from the Stars hardback, good news, it is arriving next week. And so we should be shipping out pretty soon. Yeah, so you should be in your hand in the next 10 days, hopefully, maybe two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, but they will look lovely. And also, if you've pre ordered an Eagle Moss Eagle One, oh, yeah. they are uh, at the port and they should be arriving at our warehouse very shortly after. Well, they're about 80% pre ordered. So if you want to grab okay. one, please do. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We don't expect them to be reissued. So it's, uh, it's grab them now or yeah. don't get one. Uh, but I've got them here, and they are lovely. Really nice models, really tidy. Bigger than you would expect. I know it says 10 inches, but, you know, everyone's different yeah. definition of that is different. Uh, well, so, <clears throat> I'm uh, nothing. But they are really, really nice. And I've got the side booster version here, too. Uh, we've got the lab version coming out later in the year. But what eagle would you like to see next? Uh, yes, we oh. are collaborating with Eagle Moss to see what eagle variant uh, people are after. So do let us know. Email us podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk with your eagle variant suggestion which one would you be most excited by and we will pass on your thoughts to eagle moss in due course Hmm. next week we'll be giving you a a free chapter of five star five the opening chapter which is about 34 minutes long is that right richard something like is it it's quite a big one yeah yeah uh so that'll give you a really good taste of five star five if you're not sure about it or if you're eagerly waiting for the cd version so yes that's coming next week this week it'll be the end, end of our Richard Taylor interview but for now I think mm. Mm. it's the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News uh, why did you not hey? sing? What? why did I not sing? you're resting your voice what? are you because you've got this blooming acting job next week and uh, oh I've got no, to be no, no, precious no. and uh, what? why then? no no they're going to dub me anyway probably uh, no <laughs> uh, it's because it's we had an email from Lawrence Cox did we? Yeah, Lawrence Cox says, Hi guys, I was just listening to Joe Coles from Hushkit.net on a World War II podcast, and he mentioned that one thing he enjoys talking about in aviation is topics like whether the Angel Interceptor would really work. He says possibly someone who'd be willing to talk to the podcast about the various Anderson aircraft. What's that got to do with the newsy, news, news, news? I hear you cry. Yeah, well, what does it? He then goes, Yeah, he goes on to say, Also, in case you're still looking for voice clips for the news outro, I thought you might like this. That was the news. That that was the news. Oh, I did like yeah. that. What a great! <laughs> I thought you might a great and, outro. And I think, Jamie, unless I'm mistaken, there was no extraneous appliance needed for that particular Robert the Robot impression. I don't know what you mean. Mm, really? Mm. So yes, thanks for that, Lawrence. And we do enjoy hearing your voice clips, whether it's your version of the "That Was the News" theme and I use the word loosely, or just your general comments and questions. So send mm. them in, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Yes. Yeah. Lovely. True. I look forward to more of those in due course. Uh, Good. Do you have any other emails or yeah. things from people from yeah. the Podstron universe? Of course I do. Our lovely Podstrons have been very busy uh, over on our Facebook group. Uh, just go onto Facebook and search official Jerry Anderson podcast listeners group, something like that. You'll find it. Uh, and there you'll find, for example, Steve Rogers is uh, currently holding an Anderson World Cup. And last time I looked, he was holding the playoffs between the Tracy family and Lady Penelope. Uh, Joe Jenks has uh, posted a, a link to a review saying, here's my latest video. It's a review on Captain Scarlet and the Mistrons with a little bit of a before and after after watching the show so uh, you can uh, log on and uh, have a look at that also Willow posted we've mentioned Lee Sullivan already and Willow says it's the birthday of the awesome amazing best guy ever artist extraordinaire Lee Sullivan so everyone wish him the happiest day because he deserves it so there we are happy birthday to Lee for a few days ago uh, David Munns posted a picture of uh, his latest CD box sets of Space 1999 Volume 1 and First Action Bureau saying mm. ordered yesterday dispatched yesterday 
arrived today. Cool. Got to give these a whirl from the sale. Thanks to everyone involved in the running of the store. Great service as always. Isn't that lovely? I'm glad to hear it. We do, we yeah, do our best. Chris, indeed. Chris Dale himself posted a couple more Cult TV foam machine episode entries. This is after our Fab Facts detailing. I think it was a Space Brain episode of Space 1999 and their uh, overuse of a, of a foam machine. Mm-hmm. Chris has posted a couple more with Anderson Connections. Uh, Charles Tingwell in the Adam Adamant episode, The Sweet Smell of Disaster, and Robert Vaughan in the Man from Uncle episodes, The Pop Art Affair and The Arabian Affair. Oh, yeah. I'll take his word for it. Earl Black posted how amazing are the two Space 1999 tops. Mine arrived today. I tried them on immediately. My goodness, they are amazing. I see what Jamie <laughs> said about the colour match. Just wow. On went the Koenig and in front of the mirror with crossed arms. Nice. I started to get tears of joy. Aww. Not exaggerating there. I really did get tears. Love uh, it. He says, I ordered another two, this time smaller sizes. And last year, because of our lockdown was almost eight months long with all retail, etc. closed, there was little movement. So the went up a bit. We just got locked down again, but I'm eating more responsibly now, so I'm quite happy to order another two smaller size tops, and if I lose more weight, I'll then order a medium. I love these. They are incredible. Well, well done, Earl. And uh, yeah, great to hear that uh, well, you're keeping trim and fit in these yes. difficult times. And finally, someone called Richard James posted in our podcast. Group. Oh, I, no, I thought we blocked him. Yeah. <laughs> Well, as I said, I went to the Theatre Royal in Windsor this week and I saw Ian McKellen as Hamlet and as I was uh, walking through the front of house, I saw a, you know, they have a collection of photographs from past productions Mm. posted up on the wall. Uh, Well, there's a photo from a production of The Business of Murder from 1981 featuring Francis Matthews (laughs) and George Sewell. No way. Yes, uh, there you go, a picture of the both of them. So my question to you, Podstrons, today is, did you ever see a couple of Anderson actors together from you know, perhaps different productions or the same production on stage anywhere at any point. Did you have a, a nice night out at the theatre and see, uh, oh, I don't know, Ed Bishop giving his Macbeth with Denise Breyer playing Lady M, perhaps? I don't know. Could have happened. Let us know. Have you ever seen Anderson actors playing together on a stage? I'm sure some of them must have I mean, done. Yeah, it's a bit niche, isn't it? I reckon if you ever went to see Jerome Willis, who I know uh, from Space Briefing, who I know did a lot of uh, stage work and Shakespeare work in particular, I'll bet you might have seen him on stage with another Anderson actor. You know, even someone like Stephen Burkhoff has got an Anderson connection. So if you've seen him on stage with, oh, I don't know, George Sewell back in the day or someone else, Bob's your uncle. Yes, or George is your uh, chum. Yes. <laughs> Right. Should I'm we not, leave that there? Uh, let's leave that there, but I look let's forward to hearing there. people's yeah. memories yeah. of Anderson yeah. people on stage. Uh, you know. I saw some Anderson people on stage. Did you? I saw uh, Richard James, Jeremy uh-huh. Hitchin. Uh, oh, yeah. Wow. Robbie Stevens, Nick Crikey. Riggs, Matt Zimmerman on stage yeah. at Andercon 2015. I seen Amazing. Remember. That's like a full house. Yeah, do you remember? It was, it was vile, wasn't it? It was terrible, <laughs> yeah. Uh no, I mean, here's a question for you, Jamie. If you went to, I don't know how often you go to the theatre, you're not as cultured as me, obviously. So That's perhaps true. let's say once every five, six years. Correct. Uh, if you were, you know, watching and you've got the programme and you saw there was an Anderson actor in there, would you wait backstage and go to the stage door and introduce yourself or? Depends on the right. Anderson actor. <laughs> uh, yeah, fair enough. Uh, if they were, yeah. like, significant, I think. Yeah. You know, if they'd done yeah. more than one episode of something. Yeah. Well, you'd um, get them on the podcast, wouldn't you, surely? Yeah, probably. I'd go and yeah. harass and harangue them at the stage door. <laughs> Exactly. As is my want and hobby. Yes. Mm. Very good. Good. I look forward to hearing from Podstrons there on that proposed topic from Richard James. Shall we take our journey on a Richard upgrade? Yes, okay. Uh, We're going to go across to New Zealand for part three of our interview with Richard Taylor Mm -hmm. or Wetter Workshop. Mm. Um, I realise I've broken my rule. I, I used the S word to put in Oops. his honorary title earlier in this podcast so Indeed. I apologise Richard I promise you it'll be once but I've done it twice now but I won't do it again we talk about VFX and the cost of uh, practical versus digital and uh, all things Anderson and round it up with just some nice thoughts from Richard who is uh, a brilliant interviewee and um, I really enjoy speaking to him so over to Richard Taylor part three I mean I think you can see you know, from all the miniature stuff that you you did, it, it looks very much like you your guys, you and your guys went above and beyond what anyone else would do with a television budget. 
I don't think that's unfair to say, is it? That's absolutely the case. Uh, yeah. Had it been done with commercial as the driving factor, it, it <laughs> couldn't, it just simply couldn't have been everything it was. No. This is, you know, as you can appreciate, sadly, Jamie, and I'm sure people on the call lament it maybe even more than I do, although I lament it to the point that I cry in my pillow at night, is that miniatures are disappearing from our world. Where yeah. it was the norm that if a movie was anything other than a rom-com and you had to take people to a place that didn't exist on our planet or you couldn't afford to film, you would build a miniature. You know, yeah. look at the first film of Lord of the Rings, every location bar one, is a miniature with, that required something special. The the in the whole trilogy of the Lord of the Rings, we built seventy two miniatures. We coined the word bigatures because the scale of yep. them. Um, <laughs> on the Hobbit, we didn't build one miniature, you know, and something of the scale of an avatar. You know, we'll never use miniatures um, no. because of the advancements in digital technology and so on. So one of the things that we were so focused and almost driven by on the Thunderbirds was the opportunity, maybe one of the last opportunities ever for us to do miniatures at this sort of scale and this repetitiveness. Yeah. You know, um, it's not, it's only when you see unique movies today like uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox or uh, Box Trolls or, you know, that where, where this, this unique uh, filmmaking ecosystem is happening where miniatures are prevalent to that degree. So long may that last, eh? Yeah, but it, it's, it's hard to try and convince streamers, financiers, distributors that that's the way to go now because I just say, well... Why, why go to all that expense well, and all the waste as well? You know, you, yeah, correct. Just, let's just do it digitally. So, I mean, we yeah, we are we're constantly battling on our yeah. stuff that we're developing to to keep miniatures and yeah, and, you know, and animatronic puppet characters. And quickly, just for the sake of those on the call that don't know the economics of of the comment you just made, the cost is not in actually building the miniatures. The miniatures are actually relatively inexpensive to build. Mm. Sadly, today, the cost is in the filming of the miniatures. Yeah. It's the incredible amount of time on set, the technical equipment, the expertise required to shoot miniatures that ultimately, our, our equation when we quote a miniature is uh, it's one to two, it's one one unit of cost for the miniature, two units of, of equal cost for the for the shooting of the miniature. So that's when you add it up to a total of three, then it just rules it out. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great shame. But there are people who are still, you know, able to do it from time to time and on passion projects or, like you say, unique things. So we'll hopefully we'll, we'll keep yeah. seeing them. But I, I don't want to downplay the amazing work by digital artists, though. Of course, um, no. And it's ne incredible. And ne neither do I. I no longer, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, we, we've got a uh, sister company next door with two and a half thousand of arguably the greatest uh, <laughs> film artists in the world. And we're yeah. all benefiting from uh, that extraordinary work. We wouldn't have the superior level of film and television making we have today if it wasn't for these artists. But even those artists, I think, would agree that they would love to see the ecology of model making staying alive in mm. filmmaking today because of where it came from and what it means to us all. But is it just a nostalgia-based desire to have miniatures do you think or is there something deeper that connects us when we're watching where the brain knows no matter how good we are with digital that it is something physical and tangible yes i do my quick 10 cents with my soapbox on that and please beg to disagree if you think otherwise but what i think it is and i think about this a lot of course those digital artists next door or in digital studios all over the world uh, equally as clever, arguably even more so in many cases than people like myself building physical miniatures. And what they produce is, in many cases, extraordinarily uh, more advanced. Your ability to fly through, over, see scenes and mm. stretch infinitely out, et cetera, et cetera. 
But sadly for those artists, I still believe that the average viewer goes, bah, computer. Oh, it's computer built that. No, a computer didn't build that. Heart power built it, not, you know, hardware, not hardware. It was built by a group of amazing men and women that toiled uh, tirelessly to create what you've just seen. But when the public see a miniature on screen, they immediately go, human endeavor. I can connect that <laughs> to someone just like myself, building things like I might have done as a child, and wow, look what they have created. And I think subliminally deep in the heart of every viewer, watching a movie where there are worlds built physically, they somehow connect more viscerally, more emotionally to the core content than they might do to a world I, that in theory was created in the computer. It wasn't at all. It was created by human hands and human minds and human mm. hearts. But I think there is a, a little disconnect that makes it somehow slightly different. I'm completely with you there, so I'm not going to argue <laughs> against it. <laughs> okay. I mean, because they're, they're, it is totally dissimilar, but there's still a connection to you know, digital platforms, social media, they connect us everywhere, but they disconnect us from the human touch. So it's almost almost like that with that reaction. Yeah, we see it all the time. Oh, it's on the computer, doesn't, doesn't count. So in that case, and we're sort of going on in soapbox territory here, but it's interesting, I think. The economics of miniatures and miniature shooting might not be that great for a production. Is it not something that one could balance against audience interaction and interest and engagement? to make an argument to say there is something that's worth more than the extra spend on the screen here. Indeed, I totally agree. And thankfully, there are directors in the world that believe that wholeheartedly. We're actually yeah. quoting a job right now for an American director. I wish I could tell you their name because it would uh, immediately put them onto a pedestal um, <laughs> who has come to us asking for miniatures uh, not too dissimilar to the ones that we built for Master and Commander because of his desire to do it for the very exact reason that you've just translated. I'll use an example of something that did get through and did get made. The financiers did agree. Remember that most young filmmakers, young directors that are now at an age where they can actually raise money and get a movie made have come through from birth the generation that has grown up almost entirely in the CG generated filmic world. And their most directors that we encounter today that are young don't really have a great deal of understanding or desire or need to understand a pre CG solution world. The director of um, I Am Mother came to us as a young Australian director and said, I have no interest whatsoever in building a robot in CG for my movie because I know that my movie's success will come down to one thing above all else, and that is the quality of performance that I can draw out of the young woman in the movie and how can I gain that quality of performance if they're acting opposite a tennis ball. And so we began the journey of building a physical robot, uh, the mother figure in, the, in this um, amazing movie that would give a plausible, believable, engaging, living, breathing character, or uh, living and breathing is questionable, but robot to play off his, his lead actress. And, um, you know, what, what thankfulness we have for people like that. And, uh, and um, we, you know, we're fortunate that there's still people that come through our lives that are desiring to see practical effects, physical suits, uh, yeah. characters um, and, and worlds built uh, physically. Not as often as once, but at least we continue to keep the services available should those people turn up. Yeah, no, it's brilliant that you, you're doing that. And you've got people like David Tremont who... Uh... I just have such a passion and a skill for that, that amazing work because it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, 
Richard, I could speak to you for several hours on all these things. And I had a long list of questions, which I've got nowhere near, but it's absolutely fine. I can see time ticking away. So just before we kind of wrap up, if you ever had the opportunity to remake any other Anderson show ever again, completely on your own terms, without any any outside interference and with, you know, financiers that said, yes, we're, we're OK with this practical stuff. We get why you want to do it. Which show would it be? Or would you say, actually, I don't want to. I don't want to remake any of them now. I'm done. I'm done. I've done my bit. Oh no, no, not at all. If if Thunderbirds had been wildly successful, it wasn't sadly, but it had had it been wildly successful financially, we would have immediately approached ITV to let us make another show, um, mm. and the show without question that I would have wanted to make would be Space 1999, just the, the core concept of it. Because, because you can elevate it into a Netflix adult level of entertainment, because it, at its time it was highly sophisticated in its storytelling and uh, its characterization and the sexiness of it, dare I say, you know, the, the, uh, not that many of the other shows weren't, um, we won't get going there, uh, but, um, <laughs> but the, uh, you know, the beauty and the sexiness of it and um, the inventiveness, that's a show that deserves to be remade. Someone must, in my view, someone must one day make a very high budget uh, recreation of that. We were very fortunate to work on Wandering Earth, the uh, the Chinese show uh, by Frank yeah. Guo, and that plays a little bit to similar uh, conceptual ideas of uh, you know blasting a planet off across the uh, across the universe uh, or the galaxy. Yeah. So. And it just showed today the level of sophistication that you could create in a show like 1999. And, uh, but, you know, to me, you would barely change the designs. Um, yeah, those eagles aren't going to need much work, are they? They are not going to need an iota of work, yeah. So uh, anyway, we, we feel very lucky that at least we can dream of those things. And uh, yeah, thank you, Jamie, thank you to the listeners. It's lovely talking to what is an invisible audience, hopefully more than three. I know David oh, no, they'll love will it. listen to this. And, uh, you, will. you know, it's always a joy catching up, Jamie. Um, and uh, it's um, thank you for your interest enough to want to talk with me today. So. I hope we get another chance, Richard. And thanks so much for your time and how busy you are. My best to you. Bye-bye, everyone. See ya. Well, what a well, lovely chat. Yeah, great. Um, Thank you again to Richard and to Ree, who arranged that for us after we had to rearrange uh, three or four times. It was a lovely chat. Thank you, Richard, for giving up your time. I know how busy you were, and you, you did, we managed to not quite run over. I did let him go on time, but we could easily oh, have chatted for an well hour or two. Yeah, it was really lovely. Yeah. Next week, we've got um, oh something more Richardy, but from you, Richard James. Yeah. Do you want to explain what it is and why people should listen? Ooh. Yes, well, to mark the release of Five Star Five on audiobook from Big Finished in the uh, few days just gone and on CD and in a special hardback in the days to come, I think we'll be playing the first episode. <laughs> first episode. It feels like an episode. The first it chapter uh, to Five Star Five, uh, featuring the many voices of uh, Robbie Stevens and the fantastic music design and sound design of uh, Benji Clifford, written by me. Yes. Yeah. Based on an original script by Jerry Anderson and Tony Barwick. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. So yeah. it's uh, it sounds great. Benji has yeah. worked, uh, yeah, miracles it's, with the sound it, design and music. It, it's, so. it's like watching a movie on the big screen. It's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. Brilliant. But in your ears. <laughs> yeah, so right. uh, there you go. We can look forward to that next nice. week. Anything else before we head on towards the randomizer? Because I can yeah. see Chris is sort of. He's oh. doing the last sock now, and it was quite a big hole in the heel, but he's almost finished. Yeah. So. Oh, look, he's doing that thing where he's trying to bite the uh, the cotton to break yeah. it, isn't it? It's, Don't it's bite quite, too close um, to the sock. I'm not sure no, they washed them no. beforehand. That's right. Uh, well, over on Twitter, uh, people have been hashtagging us Jerry Anderson Podcast. They've even been tagging me, Richard N. James, him over there, I'm Jamie Anderson, and him over there in the corner, darning the socks, Chris Dalek. For example, Stephen Watson, <laughs> he tweeted, I don't think even a non-vegetarian would be that keen on Thunderbird's brain's lunch bag. 
currently in the sale items at the Jerry Anderson store. Mm, you could be right. <laughs> you could be right. Uh, yeah. He also says, I listened to the too short but passionate interview on the Jerry Anderson podcast between Jamie Anderson and uh, Weta star Richard Taylor. I found the part where he shared his love for the brilliant work of Derek Meddings very moving and got quite choked up. Derek was a genius. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Emma Paulson asks Chris Dale, can I have some ice? Which, of course, is a reference to a previous randomizer. Ah, of course. Yeah. Uh, Sigma says, great pod, guys. There were two other soapy adventures with the second Doctor. You've really opened a can of worms here, Jamie. Sorry. The one you were talking about, uh, Jamie, was the mind robber, and the other was the sea yes. to death. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's the mind robber, isn't it, at the start with me? <laughs> yes. Yeah, on a similar theme, Natasha says uh, on Twitter, another non-Anderson reference would be mutiny on the buses, where the fire safety drill ends up with the whole floor covered in suds. Uh, there was an abominable snowman line as Blakey fell in the inspection pit. Hmm? There you go, I'll take your word for it. Okay. But people are obviously very keen on sending in their soap-filled, bubbly, machine episodes and stories from various TV programmes. Well, thank that's you for doing for. it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and last of all, Lost in Transition tweeted, big thank you as always to Jamie, Richard, and dear Randomeister himself, Chris Darling. Randomeister. Another, yes, oh, highly love that. entertaining instalment of the Jerry Anderson podcast. He says, may there be many more to come. Well, I mean, we're not going anywhere, are we? <sighs> not for now. I mean, I know, um, I know you're getting busier with your various jobs and stuff, well, but uh, yeah, I'm we still fitting in, don't you know, we? Had a holiday, but yeah, we'll squeeze them in. Yeah, yeah. good. So there we are. Uh, yeah, don't forget, tweet us, hashtag us, Jerry Anderson Podcast, and uh, I'll read out your tweets next time. Perfect. Well, yes, I, I, I'm definitely adopting that name for Chris, the Randomizer. Yes. Um, uh, he's finished darning. He's folded good. them all. He's paired them up. Although, oh, typical Chris, what? he's, he's he paired them as odd socks. You know, he's, Oh, Chris. But I like that. I love odd socks. So, Chris, good do on you. you. Yeah, I do. What's the point of wearing two, two socks that are the same when you could wear two different ones? Fair enough. Yeah, yeah come okay. on, think about All it. All right. Uh, yeah. Anyway, he's, Chris is here with the randomizer, his amazing machine with a big red button. He hits the red button and it picks a random Jerry Anderson episode for him to watch and then he says some things that are interesting and fun and funny. Uh, yeah. So, yes, that's why he's called the randomizer from now on. Oh. And, um, Chris, it's over to you. Oh, hello, everyone. Sorry, no time for a big introduction as we've got a very special guest today. It's only Michael Rosen. Hello! Hello, Michael. So, you have just pressed the button on the randomizer, correct? Yes. Yes, and uh, how did you find the experience? Were there any problems at all? Okay, don't worry about it. Okay, well, in that case, which episode did you get? Survival. Ah. I think you know what I mean. I certainly do. Here's UFO. Nice. And off we go. <laughs> So, welcome back to UFO on the Randomizer, and uh, oddly enough, this was an episode that was being discussed on the podcast just a few weeks ago by uh, by the one and only Ms. Samira Ahmed, who was um, talking about this episode for reasons that we shall go into later on, because uh, I'd quite like to talk about um, some of the, the points she raised there as well. Anyway, we uh, at present have a UFO sneaking onto uh, the moon... Apparently undetected by Moonbase. And I, 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 I don't know if I've ever, ever said before, but I really love the look and the, particularly the sound of the UFOs, just these evil, the evil spinning tops. It's a, it's a beautiful design and a gorgeous sound. And I do wish that we could have seen even just a little of the interiors. I know we saw a, a bit in... Uh, in uh, uh, Foster's Nightmare in Ordeal. Doesn't really count, though. Anyway, we now have uh, one alien has snuck out onto the lunar surface with a gun, and he's uh, he's taking aim at Shadow Moon Base. And this is an interesting shot that establishes there's more than one floor to those uh, spheres. One more day to go. Yep, one more day. Then, back to my favorite planet. Which one's that? Earth. Oh, I thought he might say Tatooine or something. You know, Grant, we're going to miss you. <laughs> sure. No, really, I mean, having a character like you around really breaks the monotony. Well, I'd love to stay, really. But, uh... Oh, I know, you've got a hundred chicks just waiting for you to call. Well, no, let's not go overboard. 80 or 90, maybe? Oh, this is Bill Grant. He's he's a he's a real character. He's uh, you know they'd be really sorry to lose him. He's a good egg. Everybody loves this Bill Grant guy. 
I sure hope something doesn't happen to him. In unrelated news, an alien has just fired a bullet through the leisure sphere window. Yeah, I, I hadn't really realised until relatively recently that these these spheres have more than one floor. Um, the interior of, of Shadow Moon Base has never made a whole lot of sense to me. There doesn't seem to be much room. And um, the base has certain functions that the exterior doesn't seem to allow for. But uh, anyway, Paul Foster and uh, astronaut one day to retirement uh, playing cards while there's a crack growing on the window. Thank you, sir. Hey. So Foster's lent him his lighter because, you know, you you do things like that for Bill Grant because he's just one of a kind. What would we do without him? Uh-oh. Pressure That's it. The window has blown and uh, Foster was able to get to the door, but poor old Bill... Oh, no, he's not going to make it. Air is uh, leaving the room very quickly, as are lots of uh, magazines and uh, various bits and pieces. I like the way as well they uh, establish the change in pressure with the the balloon of Straker's face that someone's drawn on it, um, getting bigger and bigger as the, the pressure changes. Poor old Bill, he can't get to the door, despite all those many, many women waiting for him back on Earth because he's just so... Oh, he's so wonderful and manly. Unfortunately, it looks like we'll have to uh, manage without him and his his chest hair and his medallion. I can't remember the actor's name, but he's actually... He's doing a really good job here as, as Foster. He's, he's trying to hold the door open. He can't make it. And just the look of, uh, of absolute horror in this uh, Bill Grant's eyes. Now as all the air is gone... Yeah, that's it for poor old Bill Grant. Oh, Bill, what are we going to do without you? But never mind, we, we fitted a new window anyway. I, I, I've always found this music, it's nice music, but it doesn't really quite fit with the, uh, the um, uh, fairly unpleasant death we just saw for, uh, for, for such an important person as Bill Grant. It's nice and happy and jolly. Tra la la la. Bill Grant is dead. Bill Grant is dead. There's his body covered by a sheet. See, it doesn't quite fit. It's too, it's too upbeat, but it's a nice tune. New port secure and tested. Repressurized. Mark is checking the uh, seal on the new window. Everything's fine. So Foster can now come back in. Oh dear, he's not happy. And uh, something that we will also touch on throughout this episode, because it is quite important, this is Michael Billington's first episode in production order, replacing our actor Franco De Rosa as the previous Moonbase commander who was sacked after, well, a few days unidentified, I believe. I want every part of this sphere searched. I want the remains of that port collected from outside and reconstructed. Oh, that sounds like fun. I want the answer. And here we go, a, a very uh, unusual shadow vehicle. Lord William Grant, killed in the line of duty, April the 12th, 1981. Had lots of birds waiting for him back on Earth. That's it, sending his, uh, his body off into space in a capsule. Presumably he had no family who might be interested in having his body back. It's just, uh, nah, we'll send it off into space. Can't keep it here. It is quite a, a, a poignant image though i've always found in this show just one one lone astronaut spinning off into space into the vastness of space whether it's this show or 1999 or thunderbirds and this is a similar kind of thing although it, it loses something not not seeing the body as such just see the capsule anyway there is your answer mark has reconstructed the window which is very good of him and it shows the fracture left by the entry of the bullet and we now pan over to Shadow, where Straker is also reviewing the same pane of broken glass. We've calculated that the projectile was fired from a group of rocks about 200 meters from the base. The chemical analysis hasn't told us much, except it's part alloy. One of the constituents is unknown on Earth. Oh, they found the bullet too. Now you're saying that a UFO landed on the moon, undetected, and one of its occupants got out and fired this projectile at moon base. Three days ago, a particularly large stream of meteorites played havoc with our tracking system. Oh, meteorites. 
Normally it's sunspots. Then just taken off again after the attack. No, the interference didn't last long enough. It's still somewhere on the moon. I've had the interceptors searching for the last 24 hours. And if they find it? My orders are seek and destroy. And who are you in relation to this series? When is the next lunar launch possible? At 1400 hours tomorrow, sir. Oh, Jeremy Wilkin answering the intercom there. Alec, I'm going back to Moonbase with Commander Foster. Well, Commander Foster, that, they, they say that a few times in this episode, and that never sounds right. Oh, Alec, could you get me everything we've got on the disintegration of UFOs in the Earth's atmosphere? Give me 30 minutes. Well, it shouldn't take that long. You probably don't have that much. I want you to countermand your orders to the interceptors. Tell them to seek and observe. Yes, I know, I know. Doesn't sound as cool. The action is to want to hit back. I liked Bill Grant, too. We were to be married. We know that a UFO disintegrates if it stays too long on Earth. All of our evidence suggests that it has some reaction with our atmosphere. And there's no atmosphere on the moon. Ooh. Exactly. He's got it. This may be our best chance ever to get our hands on a UFO. Intact. We won't be able to leave for another 23 hours. Why don't you go somewhere and unwind? Yeah, I think maybe you're right. Mm. He's, uh... Oh, he hasn't finished his glass there. You can contact me. I think I know where. Yeah, very strange that they would uh, introduce Foster in this episode as such a strong and vital character to the series. And just think this would this would fly without giving him a proper introduction, which thankfully they did in Exposed. I wonder how far they got into this episode, actually, before they realised, hang on a second, we're giving this guy so much screen time, we made him so prominent, we really need to explain who the hell he is. Because if you watch in, in production order, it's just... It makes no sense. Who is he? Where's he come from? So I'm glad that they did go back and... Um, or uh, not go back. Oh, no, in a sense, they did go back because they went one back in order to put uh, an introductory episode in for him, even though it was made after this. Anyway, we're now over at uh, Suzanne Farmer's Groovy Pad. She was a regular ITC girl on things like The Saint and, and so on, but um, this is her only Anderson appearance, I think. Which is a shame because I really like her in uh, in those shows. She's often given very sort of um, thankless the girl parts, and um, she always does a lot with them. They're beautiful. The very what you call a very end of the sixties. Here comes the seventies, but we're pretending it's the eighties. Pad she's got going on here. A great big pink elephant in the corner of the room. And Foster... Oh, Foster. You'll be home in time for supper. Being driven home by Ed Straker for some reason. Home? Moonbase. After an afternoon spent, uh... Well, playing with the pink elephant, I suppose. Oh, no, lunar module time. I hate this thing. It's so slow. I mean, I know the... the oh. Goodness, I don't even want to talk about this thing. The, the longest sequence of the lunar module is undoubtedly the beginning of Computer Affair, but I can see by my timeline on, on my project file here, this is going to run at least 30 seconds, and it's, it's pointless and it's padding. I suppose you can get away with it in early installments if you haven't seen this shit before. Hey, this is brand new, but um, when you've seen the show once or twice, or in my case... Uh, at least a dozen times, I would suspect. The lunar module just slows everything down. It is an absolute slug of a vehicle, and they insist on showing us every single stage of its journey. We are now coming up on a full minute of the lunar module. I just wonder what else they could do with this time. But, uh, hey ho. Maybe they could uh, explain how the heck anybody ever actually gets off this thing when it gets gets to moon base, because... Uh, I'm tell one of those astronauts to get those aerial photos in here fast. I have no idea. First thing he'll ask for. The second thing, Space Tracker Harrington. The first thing is a cup of coffee. Perhaps you'd be good enough to organize that. Miss Barry. Yes, sir? I met your father about a month ago. I was happy to tell him I think you're settling in extremely well. Thank you, sir. Yes, after ten years working for Shadow, I think you, I can now say you've settled in very well. Sir. Oh, Harrington, 
That's with cream and sugar, please. Yes, sir. I like Joan Harrington. I like the I like the sort of uh, sauciness and sassiness and. Uh, it's in there. Yeah, again, that was um, something else that happened in, in Confetti Check AOK. They they show that Nina Barry was with Shadow at the very start. Same as with Keith Ford. How long would it take a moonmobile to get into that area? Both of those characters are, are, are told, "Oh, you've only been with us a little while." I suggest we use two mobiles, a couple of men in each. Fine. Uh, who do you suggest as crew? I'd like a crack at that, sir. Thank you. Mark can handle it. Yeah. He knows the area. And he's Fine. been with the series longer than I have. Thank you, sir. Now, that just leaves the other moonmobile. I'll pick my own crewmen as well. I suggest we use a missiles operative. As moon base commander, your place is in the control sphere. Maybe, sir. But I was the one who saw Bill Grant's face as he tried to make it to that airlock. Ooh, that wins the argument. Yeah, everyone calls Foster Commander through this episode. Three miles from Terminator. Which in theory would put him on, on equal par with Straker. I know he's technically just commander of the moon base, but uh, I don't I don't recall Gaelis being called commander when she's in charge. He'll soon be in darkness. So it's another one of those early installment weirdness things that uh, thankfully doesn't last too long. To mobiles. Maintain close visual contact. Roger control. Anyway, we found the UFO from uh, aerial observations and we've sent out two mobiles. Don't worry, sir. I'll be breathing down your neck all the way. To go and investigate. We've got to get this UFO intact. And the moon mobiles are very obviously a lift from... Uh, Miles from target. Uh, the same... Were they, were they called Moomobiles in, in Captain Scarlet? I think they were. And the interceptors in. Is that understood? Understood. And it's nice that they sort of learnt from past mistakes that they made with that thing, although it looks really good. And the, the articulation of the Captain Scarlet Moomobiles jumping up and down as it sort of plods its way along the surface, uh, again, did eat up a lot of time. Whereas with these ones, although they're largely the same design, or at least heavily influenced by the, the Scarlet Lunaville ones, uh, unsurprisingly, because I think they're both designed by Mike Trim. Uh, it, it it's just so so much nicer to see them speeding across the lunar surface rather than that strange galumping motion that uh, the Scarlet ones did. We should be able to see them from the top of the next ridge. We'll leave the mobiles here and go in on foot. Roger. Right, let's go. <laughs> Now, when I first saw this episode as a kid, this was, uh, I believe, the third episode that was shown on the BBC after Identified and Exposed. So uh, this was our first taste of s a uh, spacesuit action, l lunar surface action um, for UFO. I know there's uh, there was the bit in uh, Flight Path at the end of that when George Cole has got the rocket launcher and he's taken down the UFO. <laughs> But I kind of like opening the series with identified, exposed, and survival, rather than identified computer affair and, and flight path. That's just personal, personal choice, personal taste there. Everything seems quiet on the UFO front. They've found it, but it's not doing anything. Foster scanned it with a variety of props. Control, have positive sighting of UFO. In the center of a crater, just as it was in the aerial shots, it hasn't moved. What does it look like? Difficult to say. But from its attitude, it could have been damaged on landing. Now what about the radiation check? Negative. It's just sitting there. Well, I suppose it's just possible it might be abandoned. There's only As one way a to find former out. radiation specialist, Klaus Hergersheimer, I feel this is an important question to raise. Right. Yellow alert. Ooh. Who's first in line? My privilege. I'll follow you. Then Brad and Don. Any questions? We can't risk Brad and Don as well. Remember, they're expendable. We want the UFO. I do like as well uh, watching these lunar surface scenes, comparing them to, to 1999s, and you can see that there's a nice evolution. The landscape in, in 1999 looks so much more, well, well I, don't, I don't want to say realistic as such, but less like a studio. I think the trouble with UFO being out on the lunar surface is it, it sometimes feels very overlit. Uh, it certainly does in this episode, but again, it's 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 early days for this kind of filming, and also they haven't um, perfected. I don't, well, they're not even attempting to do any sort of um, uh, sort of slow motion walking or moving here. They're just you know walking around as normal. It may as well just be a a, a, a standard hike in the country. So far. 
Foster has got as close as he dare to the UFO. He's waving Mark and the others in, but uh, oh dear, now it started glowing. Hold it. Get out. And Michael Billington, although um, this this is by far not his his greatest performance in the role of, of Paul Foster. Red alert. He really looks the part. He really looks like a like a leading man, like a proper hero. Um, I can understand why they, why the, the Andersons went with him. Computer for attack. Yes, sir. Anyway, now sending in those interceptors. Well, that's quite an effective model shot as well. The UFO is firing at, um, at three of our uh, cowering astronauts. And uh, yeah, they see the little figures on the model set behind a ridge. You only see the shots very briefly, but uh, it does look quite impressive as the, the UFO laser hits it and there's explosions going off everywhere. Oh, Foster's made it back to the group. Are you okay? Yeah. Straker says to pull out. We're pinned down here. Look, I'll go get a moon mobile. What if the UFO takes off? There's a chance I've got to take. Give me two minutes. Two moon mobiles for four people. Are four of you going to fit in one? ETA target, four minutes. I suppose we'll find out. How soon will you be clear? At least that's the idea. Two minutes, sir. Oh, Foster's run into a very wobbly lunar rock, banged his knee, and uh, that's it. What's the holdup? We'll be clear any minute now, sir. Go back to the mobiles. Oh, they can't hear him. Come in, Mark. Can you hear me? So we cut back to Mark and his uh, his gang of two every so often. Come in, Mark. Can you hear me? Standing around completely clueless. Come in, Mark. Oh, no. Foster's radio is gone. Something must have gone wrong. Come on, let's go. He's probably dead or whatever. I don't know why they all couldn't have gone at once. Except for, as always, the needs of the story. Anyway, the UFO's taking off. The interceptor leader has visual contact. The UFO is lifting off. Mm. Order the attack. I like seeing Straker sat at the uh, central moon base uh, desk there as well. Come on, our three interceptors are closing. And they hit it first time. What are the odds? But now the UFO is coming down on top of uh, Mark and his crew. And it hit one of our two moonmobiles. Oh, that's it. Both blown to bits. And the other moonmobile is uh, probably a bit singed. Maybe he was thrown clear. <laughs> yeah, right. There was one chance in ten million. It could happen. Well, you said yourself the moonmobile no. was totally destroyed. No. What about Brad and Don? Do they not have any insights? No, everyone's just uh, assumed Foster is dead. Even though he's... <laughs> we see on the model shot he's lying like two feet away from the uh, from where the UFO hit the other mobile. I mean, they if they got into the other mobile to go back to Shadow Moon Base, they would have been looking straight at him from the cockpit as they left. Yeah, I can't understand um, why they don't see Foster. It's not like he's hidden. It's not like he's buried. He is. He's right there in plain sight. And Mark and the others are just no. We'll go home. It's fine. That now means Foster. Alone on the lunar surface, with a broken radio, and everyone apparently having given up on him. It's strange as well to to see Straker sort of go, no, he must be dead. If I thought there was a chance, but he's dead. No, in later episodes, he would like, he would have have a limb chopped off rather than risk losing Paul Foster. And poor old Paul, plodding away under the heat of the sun. Not getting very far at all. I suspect Michael Billington has just walked from one end of the set, turned around and gone back again. There aren't... Uh, I, I think I recognise that rock. I think he was... I think he came through here earlier. Oh, so Foster has now noticed another set of footprints. Definitely not his, as he's uh, sat here perusing a map, trying to figure out how to get back to base. He's got his uh, gun at the ready, scouring the horizon for any aliens. Unfortunately, he's missed the one sneaking up behind him. 
it's well it's not a Mr. On that the music would uh, would uh, suggest that it was a very rare reuse of Captain Scarlet music there um you I don't think you ever hear the Mr. On's theme in another series because why would you it's so immediately associated with them Heavy damage it was a miracle it made it back to base the moonmobiles can be replaced and Commander Foster can't. Stop calling him a commander. That's one of the reasons I'm staying on here for a couple of days. A new commander will have to be appointed. I didn't mean that. I know what you meant. Look, Alec, there's one thing you can do for me. Foster had no close relatives, but there was someone. A girl? Yes. She was as close to him as anyone. I think she should be told. All right. What's her name? Tina Duval. Apartment 19, Windermere Hall. Right. How does he know her address without checking? It would be more realistic to say, oh, I don't know, it's, it's on, I left it on a scrap of paper in my office somewhere. You've probably got it on the desk in front of you, but uh, no, Straker seems to, to uh, rattle that uh, apartment number off uh, quite easily, almost as if, uh, as if he knew. Anyway, Alec has now headed over to see Suzanne Farmer who doesn't seem to have much of a life beyond um, well, just waiting for Paul Foster to turn up, really. Miss Duval? Yes? My name is Alec Freeman. I'm a friend of Paul Foster. And I suppose it must have been strange for Ed Bishop and George Sewell to suddenly have this uh, this third main character pushed into the mix and then be told, no, no, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's always been there. Always been there. Yeah, very important. He's friends with both of your characters. Anyway, Foster is having a very hard time of it. Or at least he's pretending to. He's fallen over again. The alien has got both of their guns. Foster seems to be running low on uh, on air. But he's also got his eye on the, uh, the alien's gun. Oh. Well, he made a grab for it. A uh, very half-hearted grab that the alien wasn't prepared for. But he got it. Aiming straight at his head, because this is the alien who probably killed Bill Grant. And I love the alien just, uh, what is that he's trading him? He, he holds up his hand and there's, I think it's uh, a valve of uh, oxygen or it could be cartridges for the gun. Either way, Paul, uh, well, he's, he's just given up again. And here we go. This is the uh, scene that Samira was talking about just a few weeks ago between uh, Commander Straker and uh, and Mark Bradley, as played by Harry Baird. Twelve hours. A, a rare sight of someone wearing the skydiver uniform on Moonbase. You realise how important this base is. It's a vital link in our defence system. Oh, really? No, nobody told me. Commands it has got one of the most responsible jobs in Shadow. I'd like you to consider it, Mark. Yep, we're down to you. You're offering me the job, sir? Yes. Does that surprise you? Not altogether. And does it surprise you if I say no? And I, before we get too far into the scene, I want to say I like what they're trying to do. You've done your duty. You've asked. And I've given you the no you wanted. What do you mean, I've done my duty? Sure. I don't think it quite works, but I admire them for trying to say something. So, I offer you the command of Moonbase, and you say no. Why? Because of this. Don't give me that racial prejudice burned itself out five years ago. Yeah, I still have the commemorative tea towel. All right. On the surface, maybe. But deep down inside of people, it's still there. Maybe it will never show. And maybe it will. Like sometime I'm ordering a guy out on a mission. A time the chances are he won't be coming back. Look, I'm not offering you some easy number. And I don't care if you're a polka dot with red stripes. You're the best man for the job. Now, do you want it? Yes, sir. I would like it. But not like this. So, yeah, the, the, there's several reasons I don't feel this quite works. You get some rest, Commander. Uh, the primary reason, I don't think Harry Baird is a particularly strong actor. I think I've spoken about this before with Computer Affair. He's, he's one of the least convincing actors in the series, unfortunately. Um, but also, I... I... I it's difficult. I used to find the naiveness of that racial prejudice burned itself out five years ago thing as if, you know, we can put a date on it. That was a bit of silliness we all went through, but now we are officially past it. Um, 
it's it's a nice thought um and again it's it's very forward thinking of the andersons that um you know this this is presumably a world where for the general you know the, the general consensus is we're not racist anymore um but as samira said straker's response of i don't care what color you are is um doesn't quite fit either the character or the tone of what they're trying to do and uh i i i admire them for trying with that scene um i i just don't think it it quite works as they intended certainly there it's a legitimate point that mark is raising it would have been nice to um to have explored that a bit more fully because it, it's a huge idea to uh, to just throw away in in one scene like that um but yeah again that's that is a discussion that um that, that you can have as as samira did with with jamie a few weeks ago and i saw on on facebook a few people leaving comments of sort of oh here we go woke pc agenda but no no these you can have discussions about these programs they're not going to fall apart if you have an honest you know objective rational discussion about you know sometimes these shows were a bit male gaze Sometimes there was a bit of unfortunate sexism. I mean, Fireball XL5, oh my goodness. Same with um, with that, you know, racial prejudice burned itself out five years ago. It's naive, but you know what? I admire the the optimism that's inherent in that statement because here we are um, more than half a century after this episode was, was made and... Uh, Let's be honest, we're we're nowhere near that 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 world, are we? Anyway, if I haven't caused a load of people to turn off there, meanwhile, Foster has been given some uh, oxygen by the alien, his new friend, and they're currently having a discussion through uh, nodding and finger waggling and such. Over the best way to get back to Moonbase. Meanwhile, our new Moonbase commander, Mark Bradley is arriving to uh, take command. Good morning, sir. Morning. Wearing his nice, shiny new uniform. It's also strange to establish that Moonbase, we need a commander. We've got to have a commander. There's got to be a man in the center seat wearing a... I'd just like to say we're glad to have you with us, sir. Thank you very much. Wearing a silver suit. And, um, well, hang on a second. First episode of the show... This is Control to Moon Mobile 3. It was Gay Ellis who was, was sat there. A lieutenant, not a commander. You've set out a mobile? Yes, sir. To the UFO crater? Yes. What? what? I did not know I needed your permission. You don't, Commander. Carry on. If you want to conduct some sort of search for Paul Foster, I mean, I was happy to write him off as dead, but, you know, um, you, you do you. Meanwhile, back out on the lunar surface, Paul Foster and Chum have uh, become firm friends. Uh, they're helping each other to cross a ravine now the alien apparently thought to bring some rope or one of them thought to bring some rope oh and he's testing it making sure the line's good to to cross the i I, to be honest i can't quite get what's going on here somehow the alien has gotten to the other side of the ravine ahead of foster to um to install the rope and now foster is uh slowly making his way along the rope overhanging this uh, this crevasse again how did the alien get to the other side he hasn't got like a jetpack or anything did he jump did he fly dunno but I do like going back to the um, the, the racism angle from the, the Mark Bradley scene I like the way it is sort of subtly reflected in two men from completely different civilizations but they are helping each other and coming together and uh, you know despite the fact that this is the alien who of course killed our poor friend Bill Grant but it's okay because the alien is our friend now too and he's helped Paul Foster make it to the other side somehow it's one of those sequences where I don't think the uh, 
the, the the live action set and the models and the editing quite establish what's going on. But Foster's happy the aliens are been enormous help to him again. But uh, this is an early example of um, you would see in, in later sci-fi shows of a one of our heroes is forced to work with a an alien or an antagonist or an enemy or whatever they've got to band together in order to survive this would be probably one of the earliest examples of that I would have thought on uh, on sci-fi television I've, I've got to say this one has never really done much for me to be honest and I think it's because of these sequences out on the lunar surface I'll take her a couple of degrees over to port they, they just feel like they've gone on forever miles on we'll go around it Right. And really, they, they haven't. They only take up about half of the episode. But whenever I think of this episode, I just think of people, two men stumbling around on a on a lunar surface set in, in almost total silence. Because that's something, oddly, you don't hear when people are walking on the moon in UFO. You don't hear footsteps, whereas you do in 1999. It's, it's an interesting comparison with how these two shows uh, went about creating a, a lunar world in, in different ways. Meanwhile, Foster and the alien, they're, they're having a man-to-man -man moment. They're both looking into each other's eyes and nodding. See what you mean? About what? That crevasse field straight ahead. Up terrain. Hmm. Well, it's clearly taken a lot out of the alien. He's fallen asleep. Yeah, this is a good... Uh, a good showcase as well for uh, the show's resident alien, Guito Santana, who played, oh, at least 90% of the aliens on this show. No matter the fact that he died in the previous uh, appearance, he would still come back to be the alien next time, probably because uh, very few people would want to be inside that suit and have those contact lenses in. Foster and the alien are just about given up, and um, Foster can see a, a moonmobile on the horizon. One thing, actually, that I've always wondered about this episode, and I said one of the reasons I'm, I'm not a fan is because of these endless scenes on the lunar surface. At least it feels like they're endless. One thing I might have done with this episode, if I had been in charge... Help! Help! Or if I'd been in the editing room, is maybe frame it as something of a, a flashback. Start out with Foster and the alien on the lunar surface. And as they make their journey back to Moonbase, we have flashbacks showing how they got into this situation in the first place. It might have helped some of the pacing with this. Um, but, you know, a lot of it is two people stumbling around in, in silence. Seen it. Which doesn't always make for riveting television. Hey, hey! Come on, wake up! We're safe! They've seen us! I do... I think you do come to like this alien, though, by the end of the story, and you like Foster's relationship with him. Bring an air cylinder, hurry! But again, we're coming to one of uh, UFO's typical downbeat endings. We're safe. They found us. Now, now, you stay here. Do you understand? You stay here. Yeah, Foster's going out to meet two men from the uh, the mobile. He's very excited, telling his alien friend all about it. Well, Foster made it all of three feet away from the alien. Again, I don't think this episode establishes um, a geography of, of sets very well. It looks like Foster has collapsed and been found by the Moonmobile pilots, like uh, two feet away from where he was with the alien. I, I suspect they had a very limited number of uh, lunar surface sets for this episode. Probably just the same space redressed. And with no radio... Listen, there's an alien. Foster has to shout to his rescuers. Yeah. He's saved my life, he's a friend. And even then they can't hear him. Okay, Commander, we can't hear you. Right, let's lift him up. One of these actors, I can't remember his name, but he later returned in uh, the Dalatech affair. He's uh, one of the personnel at the Dalatech base. It's a rare example of an actor returning to the series. He's a friend! Take it easy. And going from working in Shadow to working in an organisation that doesn't know anything about Shadow. Normally it was the other way around when people made return appearances on these shows. Shall we carry him, sir? Hold it a minute. Listen. That's clever. Listen. Pressing his visor to Foster's visor. He saved my life. <laughs> an alien. Oh, but the only thing he hears is... He said something about an alien. An alien. 
And the other guy is just like, right, I'm going to beg me an alien. He's got his gun. No! Oh, Foster's... No! Oh, no. Can't kill the alien. Oh, the alien's getting up to meet the shadow guy and... Dead. Oh, no. Foster's lost two best friends in the space of a few days. Oh. Again, I would have liked to have seen some, um, some fallout from the idea of, uh, if not a friendly alien, then an alien who is willing to work with Shadow. But with this and with um, a question of priorities, there's no real discussion of you know, just what that might mean. Um, I would have loved to have seen him get back to Moonbase with Foster, but anyway. I don't understand. I'm told you're dead. Then you're alive. He walk in here as if nothing has happened. I can't take it anymore. You've always known there are things I can't tell you. About your job. But does it come before everything? Even me? Well, it depends if I've always worked for Shadow or if I used to be a test pilot who now works for Shadow. At this point, I don't know. Sorry. No, that's oh, it. My poor. Oh, he's walking out on Suzanne Farmer and her pink elephant. Paul? Oh, you said you wanted him gone. He's gone. Gone for good. Gone to have a long string of uh, other lady friends on a weekly basis. Oh, that's it. Now, uh, Alec Freeman is driving him home today. He's uh, Paul's designated driver. I'll buy your drink, Alec. Fine. At this point in production order, I basically know nothing about you, but I'm always up for a drink. And that was Survival. And, well, as I said, I'm not a huge fan of this episode. I certainly don't think it's a bad one. I think there are some some pacing issues. I don't think the show is as sophisticated as it would later become to handle some of the some of its ideas and um, particularly as we've discussed the um the mark bradley racism was over five years ago thing oh it's um I, I kind of wish you could take this script and have it produced during the pinewood era just to see if if it would have been more effective if the pacing there's something there's some way we could fix this episode it's not bad it is just quite slow, and I think with a, a bit of a polish, bit of a faster direction, something a, a bit slicker production, we could have something really good here. As it is, some good ideas, and poor old alien, he killed the alien. That's not fair. Oh, with the creepy outro music, a bit of uh, yeah. UFO. I, yeah, it's been a while, isn't it, I think? Mm, feels like ages, yeah. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, it's funny. But so, then it's random, so... Oh, it is, yeah. it is, but yeah. it's still a welcome return from the team from Shadow, so... Yes. Uh, thank you, Chris, that was marvellous. As always, yes. there'll be more random stuff next week. That's true. Uh, not just from Chris, but from, from us too. We say random things all the time. Any final wrap-up thoughts I mean, or things from Podsterons, Richard James? Speak for yourself. My, my, all my comments are, you know, finely honed and tightly scripted. I don't uh, know where you get this random I don't know where from. you get that script from. It's not from me. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, well, no, just to say that next week we'll be coming back to your uh, Six Degrees of Anderson, Jamie, to hear oh, what people have been sending in. Yes. So there might still be time to get your uh, ideas into podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk to be read out next week. Uh, uh, but that's all for now, really, I think. I think we should let them go. Oh, yes. Think? Yeah, release yeah. them. I mean, look at them. Release yeah. them. They've all got hashtag clammy ears now, so it's time to let them go. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for listening, Podstron. It's great to have you along. Please make sure you've yeah. subscribed and rated and reviewed. I mean, yeah. we know that there are thousands of you that listen. So We do know that, yeah. But there aren't thousands of reviews. So mm -hmm. is it you? Mm -hmm. I'm talking to you. Is it you that's been oh, naughty yeah. and hasn't had to Oh, it is them. Look at them. Yeah, I know. They're, trying, they're looking sheepish. Look, Got looking my away. eye on you in, yeah. my, in your ear somehow. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah it's, it's, that's why they're clammy. Um, okay. Right. So please do go and leave us a review. We, we really appreciate it. And we do read them. And um, they make us very happy unless they're mean. And then they make us sad. So don't leave. Yeah, we just ignore them. them. Don't leave a mead one. Yeah. Okay, right. We'll go now and leave you to it. Yeah. Have a lovely, right. lovely day. Bye. Goodbye. Stage one complete. Let's go. Spectrum.
Sun is green. Speaking of lovely days. Oh, yes. Uh, what are you doing for the rest of yours? The rest of today? Yeah. Uh, well, I've got to put a final coat on the stairs, if you must know. I've also got to finish weeding the drive. Oh, yeah. It's all go being an actor, I tell you yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. The busy life of an actor. Uh, so are you, are you uh, having a, a strip of carpet up your stairs then? Yes, I am. I yes, thought that's you right, were from the paint job. Because the paint job you did that I saw, I thought... He hasn't right, really finished those. He's not finished. He hasn't done the middle. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's right. But we're having, you know, the, the runner, the geotypical runner. I wonder if there are any Anderson themed carpets. You know, like you used to get the old wallpapers and duvet covers. Oh, that'd I be think cool. it's unlikely, but you never know. Oh. Um, what what colour runner are you getting? Oh, it's going to be stripes. I think grey, black, white stripes. Nice. Mm, yeah, look quite nice. Running up the yeah. stairs or along the That's right, the st- yes. No, okay. Up the stairs. Yeah, yeah. Very if cool. I'll post a picture if you're Please that do. Interested. I can't. As, <clears throat> there's nothing I'd like to see more than your stripy carpet. Well, I mean, you seem very <laughs> interested in the state of my stairs for some reason. <laughs> Only because I was judging the quality <laughs> of your paint job. Um, yeah, fine. Well, look, it enough. sounds like you've got very important things to do. So you go and weed well, and I paint. Have, to be honest. Yeah. And uh, I'll see you next week. All right, bye. Bye. Charlotte, where'd you put my brush? You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. 